dear beautiful community, uh, dear beloved teacher. Mm, so wonderful to be in Plum Village together. Today is um, June 29th, a day of mindfulness in, in Upper Hamlet. And we're sitting in still water meditation hall, which used to be only half the size. Now it feels like you're entering an airplane. You know? yeah, every time I come in, it's very long. <laughs> Mm. Recently, uh, before uh, a couple of weeks ago, we had a few lazy days after the business retreat. We had a business retreat for seven days with uh, a lot of people who came from all over the world, and they uh, they had a wonderful time. And the brothers afterward had a few lazy days, so I was able to uh, go with a few brothers to go camping near a cave, near one of our brothers, uh, our blood brothers' home in southern, in southeast France somewhere, next to the Dordogne River. And he lives in this valley uh, with two cliffs, mountain cliffs, overlooking and the Dodon kind of cut through the valley and it carved, it carves the valley. And so uh, the cliff is right there. You look out the window and you can see. And uh, I miss climbing rocks and mountains. So the brothers, mm, they went uh, somewhere. I woke up early and uh, did a hike. Actually, it was in the afternoon. It was, uh, uh, they went, oh yeah, they went swimming. But I, I wanted to go climbing. So I put on some climbing shoes and, and I asked his uh, sister-in-law, I was like, how do you go over there? I want to get to that cliff. <laughs> she said, oh, just go. And Pop Lin said, you go around the railway station or the train station or something. Uh, the bridge, the railroad bridge. And so I just said, oh, I'm going to head that direction. So I climbed. And I found some paths. And, and uh, I don't think people hike there uh, recent, recently. I think it's the season, beginning of the season. So I had to find the path a little bit. But eventually, uh, I just keep in mind that cliff where I want to go. And I eventually found there's actually a path already. And uh, I was so excited to go up there because the sun was setting. And I wanted to, <laughs> mm, because I didn't know the way, I wanted to, uh, so my breath was very. Uh, and finally, uh, oh, well, I f- found a few places, uh, but it wasn't the cliff, but I finally got to the cliff right before uh, the, the sun was coming down. And as soon as I uh, sit down and I look for a place, because up there the rocks are uh, actually uh, uh, quite spiky, but there's a few areas flat. And as soon as I sat down, I see this rock. It's a beautiful rock, and I want to show you. It's my friend. It's a, it's a, like a tableau. Yeah? I hope you can see. It's so beautiful. It's my, uh, my friend. Yeah. And the rock said to me, why are you so hurrying to get up here? Don't you know by now? <laughs> That's what it said to me. <laughs> I swear, I think I'm going crazy, but... And um, it's because uh, it's just so, uh, what do you call it? Uh, I love art, and it's just the way it's arranged. 
is uh, nature. And uh, I bow uh, and I thank the rock for reminding me. And it actually looks kind of like, uh, uh, what is it? What do you call those things on your deathbed? A tombstone. So if you can see closely, it says R I P. Rip, rest in peace. Rest in peace. Now this is uh, my friend reminding me, Brother Phap Yung, sit down in peace. Because one day you will, uh, will lie down as well. So I want to introduce you to my friend. Mm. That afternoon, evening, it was a very lovely to sit and you know, see the, uh, the sunlight slowly changing. There's so many colors. You can see why the artists love southern France to do their painting, the Impressionists and, the, and so on. And as I was watching the light change among the cliffs, you, you, uh, you can touch a different time. The human time is 50 years, 100 years. But if you can touch the time of the valley, of the cliffs, of our friend here, it's wonderful huh? to feel being part of the earth part of the rocks. We have elements of rocks in us, of the mountain, the minerals. So we do have a mountain element in us, each one of us. And sometimes we need to make time, we need to make time to come in touch with a, a different kind of time, not the watch, your t- eye touch, your calendar, the whiteboard, the schedule. Mm. This is how we've uh, been trained and we've lost our ability to touch uh, kind of timeless space. So when we sit, we become non-human. You can sit and be something bigger than human. You can be the stream. You can be the rain. In you, there is an element of rain. More than half of your body is made of clouds. You don't feel disconnected. Whole timeless spring, timeless stream, timeless clouds cycling through our lungs. So sitting there on the cliff, uh, I was able to nourish myself with uh, mm, a kind of uh, food, they call it, in, uh, in the meditation school. They uh, have a phrase, uh, say, uh, in Vietnamese, is Tien Yuk Vi Tuk, is the the joy, the wonder of meditation is your daily food. It's beautiful. Huh? It's like you think of food, you think of you know, chocolate, and cereal, muesli, and carrots, and rice, like a baguette. Right? You think of food, and the first thing you think of is like that. But when I first came across this phrase, uh, from our teacher, 
thiền diệt bi thực Is, uh, ai biết tiếng việt uh, viết cha xanh được không xem <cười> she has i'm very bad at vietnamese writing thiền diệt không xem biết tiếng việt không chờ kể sau nó sẽ đẹp hơn cho anh She said her handwriting is terrible. It's okay. We know how to meditate and see beyond. Viết to to lên. Thiền duyệt vô. Duyệt là wonder and, or the joy. The joy. Thiền is a meditation. Duyệt is a, the wonder, the joy. Vi thực is a food, is a daily food. Cảm ơn chị em. Thank you. Thiên diệt vi thực. I wish I knew the Chinese, but I don't. <laughs> mm. So this is a way of training in the practice center, in a meditation center to begin to train ourselves uh, to have a habit of looking at uh, meditation as a f- source of food. And what is this food? It is the stillness. It is in the stopping. It is everything you're learning here. It's slowing down. Whatever that is, that nourish you in a deep way. We call it the spiritual food. It is whatever that nourishes our, our heart, our soul, our something non-human. Not the daily drama of, oh, I like you, oh, you're so beautiful. I, these are human kind of thing. Thiên Duyệt is a, a different kind of food. It's more internal. It doesn't require external uh, sentiment, set, you know, like feelings. Uh, someone compliments you, someone don't like you, someone like you, or someone, something went well, you achieved something, you know, you accomplished something. Thiên Duyệt is uh, the ability to stop and to nourish ourselves with nothing. Don't need anything. That is the food. It's kind of strange, huh? But it's, uh, that's what we're training. Every day we must remember to eat this food. We remember to eat three times a day and sometime in between, right? But how many of us remember to, just with one breath, you can be filled with that spiritual food. Stop. Why am I keep looking for it? The moment of stopping and being present with your breath. Out breath, let go. Not needing anything, that you are already what you want to become. That is a training, it is not a teaching. We have to train to stop and accept ourselves, wherever we are on the path, however much suffering, however much joy we have, to accept us as we are. It's a kind of love that we can give ourselves. Spiritual food is another word for love. Stopping to love ourselves. We don't need to buy ourselves anything just one breath. S- 
stealing our body is another type of food. We're so in the habit of rushing or having something to do, being helpful, being useful, being better than, and learning to stop and do nothing, to be still. With the out-breath, relax. Don't need to strive, even in meditation. Every out-breath, I train myself with the in-breath, feel the connection, the nourishment with nature, with the air, with Mother Earth, with the cosmos, with the trees, the leaves. On the out-breath, I let go and let my ancestors relax. My ancestors have been running for hundreds of years, thousands of years. I have a Chinese ancestor and Vietnamese ancestor. If you know some parts of their history, they've always been in need, in wanting, in lacking. The Vietnamese ancestor as well. We live in a part of the world where a lot of uh, change, a lot of floods and hurricanes and not much to rely on. But you always feel like you got to have something. So when I met the practice to stop and let go with the opera, and I smile to my Vietnamese ancestor and my Chinese ancestors. Oh, Grandpa, Grandma, you don't need to hide the gold anymore. It's free. You know, I, sometimes I say that. My grandma likes to hide gold in bricks and things because she feels like we might have to run from war again. She ran from China, and then in Vietnam she had to run from Vietnam. So she's always finding bricks and putting gold. She buys gold pieces and folds it and puts it in a container and she hides. And I used to watch where she hides it. <laughs> <laughs> so I breathe out from my ancestor and I relax. There's so much shoulder in the world, you know, forward. They call them uh, all different types of very uh, innovative, progressive. Mm-hmm. Uh, start up is a, do something. Don't just sit there. <laughs> that energy, no more. That is food. And you don't mm, have to do it just sitting. You can do it while walking. When you walk, you can also touch spiritual, the joy of meditation while you walk. And sister, we don't need to run. There is no more war in me. With each step you take, when I first learned walking meditation, it lasted for a while, for maybe a couple of months. It's great. It's nice to walk behind tight because you don't have to do anything. Just follow tight. And once in a while, you, you, uh, you're left running, rushing. Mm. And I remember uh, when I first uh, made the commitment to really train to walk from my room to the office. I remember uh, training that before I make the next step, I have to find balance with my, the, the foot 
that is stable, that is not moving. You know, some of you take Aikido, you know, uh, you always have one foot stable. You can, you, you never lose. Uh, you know where your weight is, on what foot, on what leg. So at the beginning, I made that my training to walk. And before I make the move, I know where my weight is, and then I shift. So it, uh, it was a way I had to train myself to really slow down, because I ran, I, I ran a lot, not just in my feet and legs, but in my mind. I have to go there, get there. And that's like after a year, it, all the heavy energy come up because I learned, oh, I know my walking meditation. Now that's something you do when you gather and you do. But it's hard to do when you commit yourself to doing it. Because I was not getting nourished uh, uh, walking around. I, you know, and I keep reminding us, you know, enjoy each step. It's like, yeah, yeah. Yes, yes, I understand. Yes, yes. Don't walk and talk. Yes, yes, yes. I can do that sometime. <laughs> but it's not for everyone. It's only for those who want to feed themselves. That. You know, not everyone have to go eat lunch. You can go home and eat hamburger, instant noodle. You don't have to eat lunch. Just like you don't have to do walking meditation. But it is your choice. That is the difference in my mental attitude. Thai is not looking around for me, you know. Like, where's what you doing? <laughs> but it was, uh, I chose to train. And it was difficult. Once you make a decision, to discipline yourself, all your challenges will come. They will tempt you. Oh, you've been so good. Just forget about it. <laughs> all the excuses. You know, as soon as you make the commitment to discipline, it is easy and difficult at the same time. <laughs> Walking meditation is tough. Because we do it all the time. As soon as you walk out of that door, mm. and it requires some time, of course. Uh, but I made a commitment only from my room to the office. <laughs> That's it. You know, and going up the stairs from uh, the dining hall to the resident in Deer Park, there was a stairway. Oh, thank God for the stairway. Again, rock. You're thankful for the rock, the concrete. I know that stairway very well. 57 steps. Is that right, Fort Lou? <laughs> Plus minus. Yeah? And you can see kinds of ants. Every time you walk up that stairway, and when you walk down, and one day you will find yourself, you're late for walking or sitting, and you're going to rush down. Hmm. You do it a little faster. So it took me uh, yeah, some effort to uh, train myself to be nourished with walking meditation. To plant your feet with awareness. What is this? Why, how does this become food? Because when you're aware of your step, your mental energy is uh, present and you're no longer thinking about the future. You're not longer thinking, period. The non-thinking is a kind of food. 
It's like having the motor or the engine stop and rest. So the Thai, out of his compassion, brought the walking meditation, the formal walking in the hall outside. So we can enjoy nature and to walk around and be in touch, to feel connected. It's not a, uh, just a, a walking, you know, one pointed. Mm. Walk like you drive a car. You're aware of other people, you're aware of nature, the birds. So your senses are, is heightened when you're present. So you train like this, so that the walking meditation becomes a food. So I don't know what the trick is for you, because we each have our own ancestor. And each one of us has to find a way to present the walking meditation to our ancestor, so that they will receive it. This is a, a kind of liberation from the cushion. It's no longer meditation, sitting down on the cushion and look like the statue. But now, meditation like an ordinary person walking. Thay had this insight because he, you know, the Buddha must have had to go to the city to beg, right? And he must have walked back to the forest. How would the Buddha walk? I mean, mostly we see the Buddha sitting, you know, like doing teaching. And, but we imagine, just imagine, how does the Buddha walk in the village? So these kind of images help me to really come in touch with the Buddha within me. Walk in peace, no running away from the war inside. I walk in such a way that your steps, your body, every cell is in touch with Mother Earth. And this is possible. Training to see that something, make a commitment. So I share, not throughout the whole Plum Village here that you walk in, but make a commitment from the tea room here in Upper Hamlet, find a place. This is how we train. You start with a small piece and then bigger piece. In New Hamlet, I take the road Instead of going through the gate, I take the road and watch the sun rise, you know, from the bus area before I enter New Hamlet. In Lower Hamlet, there's an area where there's a row of uh, trees, kind of pine, cypress or a pine tree. The Thai likes to walk from there to the meditation hall. I like to take that path. And I try to see Thai's footprints and it helps me. See, you make some parts of your physical environment become the place where you eat the meditation food. You understand? It's like the dining hall. You go to the dining hall to eat. You go there to eat your spiritual food. It could be on the cushion, so you're sitting here not for some future uh, enlightenment, but you sit like you sit in the dining hall and you eat with your heart, you eat with your breath. So this is what we train in, in terms of <coughs> meditation or mindfulness. The three energies, mindfulness, concentration, and insight, 
we must wonder, it's like the only place we have in our logo with actual text. So it's quite important for Thai, for the tradition. The mindfulness is one aspect, but to do it regularly, to eat it regularly, becomes a habit. And your concentration, your mindfulness energy, becomes stronger, you become healthy. That kind of energy will help healing, will help nourish, will help you thrive. This is a kind of food. It's not just the medicine, the food, the edible food. We have to train ourselves as practitioners to eat spiritual food, so the concentration. And this you will need. There will be moments in our life when challenges come up, suffering will arise from our ancestors. And you don't have enough concentration, you don't have enough spiritual strength, spiritual health. It's very difficult. That's why we need to eat it every day, hopefully more than three times a day. But if, you know, too difficult to eat three times a day, just have a snack. Make it, mm, I'll have a snack. Maybe just a little bit of breathing, a little bit of walking. And the rest, eat junk food. I'm kidding. No, no, take that out. <laughs> you know what I mean. Don't be so hard on yourself. But you will need this. So you keep asking, mm, you know, why do I keep facing, facing this difficulty, these to uh, heal and to overcome and why do I easily react and have dramas in my life? Mm, my experience is that the more you eat the spiritual food, the more spiritual health you have, then the, the dramas, the human drama, it, it becomes less... Uh, uh, it somehow it uh, this disturbing in the West. Sometimes we in the modern times now we do a lot of psychoanalysis and therapy and you know what is it healing child healing five year old healing uh, inner child healing uh, any other stuff. Uh, look at it, see, look, and try to heal, right? In Zen, there's a different kind of healing. Yeah. Nourish ourselves, and providing, nourishing the spiritual health, and naturally, your psychology, your psyche, your body can find healing. And you don't need to know why. Oh, it's because my father was like that, and my own, oh, my ancestor. It will heal. You know, you ever ask him, that, body, how come you heal and stop bleeding? You know, the, the womb is going to look at you and say, come on, this is, that's naturally what happens. So we, this is a, a different, uh, another way of healing. Not too analytical and picky and words and stories and history and childhood and all this stuff. That's one way. I'm not saying uh, that does not help. It's helpful to revisit our stories. But there's another healing that happens in the mountain, in the forest, next to a stream. It's not the human healing. It is the non-human healing. Sit next to a stream and let the stream heal you. Not with your story, but with your stream inside. That healing yourselves will awaken. And it doesn't have a story. 
it naturally wants to live and flourish. That is what the womb says. It's my nature to love you. But you keep telling me these stories. I want to help you. But you keep holding me down. This is the non-human healing. Rely on the mountain, the clouds, the streams, the earth. We think we are separate from Mother Earth, that we are human, homo sapiens, and we can figure everything out. This is the mistake of our time. We think we can solve everything, go to Mars, because we cannot get it right here. This is wrong thinking. We need to have trust. We need to bring back that kind of awareness, spiritual awareness. You know, we get interviews a lot and they ask all these problems. Where is the source? How to solve? It is again that mind trying to solve it. With its own thinking. It is that same thinking that made the problem. I think there's a quote, something about that. Einstein or someone. And it's, you cannot solve it with that same kind of thinking. You try to manage nature. It doesn't work like that. Just stop and the grass will grow and you see your pathway. It's just a pathway. Don't be so stuck with it. Nature has many pathways. This is something that I touch in terms of healing my wounds, my psyche, my, uh, my story, my father, my mother, these human stories. Sometimes I tell them, but other times I see, ah, you know, don't be so proud of your little dramas in your lifetime of 60, 80, 90 years. The earth, the galaxy. What is, what is your story compared to the story, the life of our galaxy? Wow, what a wonderful, and it's giving us life to live and to enjoy. Yeah. Come in touch with that. That kind of food. You have to train to look differently. Remember, non-human. We are not just humans. We are all the elements that nourish us. When you eat the carrot, become the carrot. Let the carrot, the orangeness of carrot, come through your blood. When you eat your food, it is not just vitamin C, protein. What is it? Amino. Amino this, amino that. Is it? Now people look at food not as carrot. It's vitamin C. It's carotene. Apple. Vitamin C, water, organic. It is not just that. So please begin to see in light of spirit, things are alive. Things, a rock can nourish you. A broccoli. Don't look at it just as a molecule thing. It is spirit. Eat the broccoli. See that it's taken weeks to multiply and to bloom with the sun and the water. The broccoli smiles at you and fully wants to join you. Chew the broccoli 
It doesn't feel hurt, so don't have a complex. It loves to join you, your community, and your stomach with all its community of little, uh, what is it? Digestive community down there. Like, Buckley! <laughs> that is a spiritual food. I, I'm more fun. I don't, I'm not too serious with food. I like to have fun with food. It, uh, it uh, nourishes and it flows. So eat in that way. Don't underestimate that this is, you know, you eat it like, you know, food that we're used to. It's like, ah, it's just to fill me up. But what a shame. When we eat, we are also being, train yourself to be nourished also by the Spirit. This is uh, possible. So you come here to, uh, to learn this. We call it mindfulness practice and so on. But what you're learning is how to eat a different kind of food, something lacking. I've been reflecting a lot about the state of our planet and climate change and so on. There's a lot of things that we can do. I think last week, Brother Fab Lu shared beautifully about the different, very comprehensive way to help. Not just look at the small picture, but fundamentally, uh, with most of the things happening in the world, it is a crisis of our the spirit, how we train, how we educate our young people. This is the fundamental, how we organize our society, our families. It is a breakdown of the spiritual uh, uh, mm, mm, awareness. Somewhere it happened maybe three, four hundred years ago, something happened. We begin to be too smart and too proud because we made gadgets and things work. And it's wonderful, science and the organizing of our society. We've become more uh, efficient, more aware, more, uh, more knowledgeable. We can dissect things and organize it very well. And now they're trying to look at the spiritual stuff, slowly encroaching onto kind of find out how you work. Yeah, some of my brothers have been getting, uh, you know, all kinds of treatment. It's like a kind of a way of like seeing data, seeing things. It's helpful. It's nice to be informed. But I uh, come in interaction with children now. Mm. Less and less they are aware of the sacred, of the spirit. They have no respect for plants. They have no respect for each other. They, uh, it's all me, me, and what I need. That's more the individual selfish. But there's an element of, uh, they're not, they don't know how to look at a mountain or the sunset, or the joy of drifting in the lake, or lying next to a stream. It's, it's again, it's our culture. We are teaching our children that there's more on the internet. Everything you need to know, you can Google it. This, you know, is a kind of a This is the root of uh, why we are in our situation around the globe. A kind of discontent because we are not being nourished spiritually. In our school, we don't teach young people how to be nourished by the spirit. Everything is material, everything is object, Everything is 
information, knowledge. There is no insight, inner connection. This is what we need to bring back to education. It is not religious. It is fundamental in our being. Our nature is to feel connected. Everything we teach in school is break down, disconnect, organize. This is the way I was trained. I don't know about you, but maybe some of you are lucky. You went to a very special school. But there are teachers, of course, out there teaching in a spiritual way. I had a ceramic teacher. I think I shared this. She, was, she made a, quite an impression on me when I was in uh, element, junior high school, beginning of junior high. We had to take an art class. And she would teach me how to center, to sit on the bench and calm yourself before you touch the clay. Put your elbow and feel it. Hmm? Feel the clay. Don't try to do something. Just feel it first. This is an amazing teacher. I don't, I don't know what kind of spiritual, I never asked her what kind of spiritual background she had, but she uh, made quite an impression on me. She didn't teach me about breathing, but I have a feeling the diaphragm, she's taught me about the diaphragm. Relax it, don't tighten it up. You, know? you tighten up, the clay will fling all over. Yeah? The practice like that. Sit, relax. Walk, relax. Why are you so tighten up? Brush your teeth. Sometimes I sit, I stand there in front of the mirror and I hold my toothbrush and look in the mirror. When I was training to brush teeth, yeah, try it. It's quite insightful. Before you, because it's so automatic. <laughs> Sorry, that's the way. I, you don't see me like that, but. <laughs> Come on, be a decent human being, or at least try to be a decent monk. <laughs> no one sees you in the bathroom, but your brothers do, you know. There's another food I want to mention before ending. Is uh, togetherness. Is uh, I add a new line. I say, I hope this is correct. Dong dong yu. Togetherness. Can you write dong? Dai dong. Thai had a movement in the 60s or 70s called Dai Dong, the Great Togetherness. It's the UN of planet Earth. No, no, I don't like the word nation. Maybe the United People, UP of nations should be get rid of. You know, it's too much trouble when you start making borders. Huh? Dong, D O N G. You know with the hat, and then a yaw huyen. Thank you, Sam. Cái đó mà xấu hả? Trời ơi! She writes so beautifully. I love her T's. And her D's. Tài đồng, đồng. It's a kind of togetherness. And this also we need to train and educate our children. I said uh, the last century can be characterized as the century of the self, of the individual. I took many art classes and I learned a lot about art. And it's all about 
the signature. <laughs> right? I made that. Right? It is the foundation of our society. The I. Sister Langim, the manas. Hello, manas. That's what we were trained in the last century. Your ancestor, your parents, your grandparents, your great grandparents. We can do it. Oh, that forest, take it down. More food, organize. We can do it. It is very uh, dangerous the way we, and you can see the symptoms in our lifetime. And they say, we, some people are quite uh, optimistic. It is in our lifetime that we will solve it. Again, manas, we will solve it. <laughs> Part of solving it is we need to train to be aware of the collective, aware of there are other things happening besides what is happening with your life your practice. I remember uh, learning to enter the room. I was immediately put on attending Thai, you know, uh, uh, to help Thai with this and that, and I have no idea. What, I don't even know what a monk is when I enter the community. And Thai asked to, me to be his attendant, and. I remember many times entering his hut, and he had guests, you know, and I would go, you know, and my energy that I bring into the room, I would, <laughs> I want someone to hide. <laughs> and so Thai teaches a uh, knock. And he opened the door. And that three knock is not to let the person in there know you're coming in only. The knock is there for you. To know how to enter a room. Very difficult for me at the beginning. I'm from Los Angeles. You know, transitions between doors, cars, freeways, exits, entry, you got to be quick or you're not getting in. <laughs> I grew up with the freeway of Los Angeles. You got to, you got to be. So my habit is always throw your shoe over, get in. I can do that with my leg. <laughs> you know, you, you know how to do that? It feels so good. You go in, you go. But these doors don't do that. They, ah, come on. <laughs> so as you can imagine, very difficult in the early days of training. I was like, ah. And that makes quite a difference how you enter. And when you enter, I begin to train to feel the collective, the energy that is in the room. You have to know who's in the room. What kind of, you have to learn to train to feel the energy. In school, in society, I remember it's just, you come in and you just make some noise, like, hey, what are you doing? How's it going? You know, you, is it kind of like, it doesn't matter if you disturb or someone else, you know, it's, Anybody can disturb anything. Now with the cell phone, the same thing. But how to be considerate of the collective energy of a, and know how to enter it requires training. When you move in and you find a seat, you're being trained, not by anybody, but by a collective energy. This is something I need some training. That's just on the human realm. 
the togetherness, it's also on the nature realm, planet earth realm. Togetherness, the joy of togetherness as a spiritual food. This will bring healing for your disconnection. We feel empty inside. Something our parents didn't give us, our ancestors didn't give us. And we go looking for that. But you already have it. This is Thay's message. The part of the healing is you don't go look for it. You're already together. Just let the cloud in. Let the flowers in. Don't block it. Let the water in when you drink. Don't just drink H2O. Filtered osmosis, natural, come from the Alps, drink Mother Earth, train yourself to feel connected. Many of us feel, because we're stuck in our human story only, so togetherness here is not just being with humans and chit-chatting and feeling connected and feeling like you're understood and I understand them and all we are friends. Spiritual food is beyond that. It's not just that. Spiritual food comes from a connection, no separation. We have to bring back that trust. We've lost the kind of the way we've been taught and educated. We've, we've lost trust in that ability to heal and to be nourished. The two elements I think I added to the immeasurable love. I think one of our sisters mentioned it or someone recently. Uh, the two last elements I added, I think Brother Lai, in the business talk, he, I added uh, kind of reverence, respect, and uh, the element of trust as immeasurable. Your trust needs to be nourished, to be maintain just like the other four elements love, joy, compassion equanimity they're immeasurable because they are like a plant that you bring home it is not something fixed trust is not fixed if you don't take care of trust and nourish it it will wither So nourishing our trust in Mother Earth in our own ability to heal and to find and to touch no longer running. There are good signs uh, happening because of our state of the world, more and more awareness uh, that uh, we, meet, we need to work together. We need to collaborate as a planet. There's more and more awareness. That's something nice about the technology, helping us connect and communicate with each other. The challenges, the uh, innovations. I hear China is quite uh, becoming really on the ball with 
alternative energy, especially solar. And once China gets onto something, they're going to take over. It's good. It's better than oil. But this is a, a good news that we are working together. And because of a certain condition in the U.S., many mayors and governors are coming together to work. And you say, you know, we don't, get, we don't need you up there. We could do it ourselves. I mean, that would never happen if the U.S. did not come out of the Paris peace talk. You know, take away our commitment. That would never happen. We'd just say, oh yeah, great, the government will take care of it. No problem. But because some difficulty, people are having to come together. But again, uh, I wish those people would uh, touch spiritual food. Because uh, that's one thing we need to bring to the table. And when we visited the uh, uh, Paris, climate um, conference, uh, COP21. It was the first time that, uh, at that conference they invited spiritual leaders. Our own community were, was able to go there. And we were all able to offer the message that this is not... Uh, we had interviews. They come up and they ask us, why are you here? I mean, this is a political and... Uh, this is a political and scientific problem. I mean, they need to solve it. Why are you here? You know, they look at us, you know, and they're like, oh, <laughs> we're here to walk around, <laughs> to have fun. I was we had all kinds of answers, depending on who we're looking at. But they, they, they didn't think we, we belong there, like the spiritual traditions of the religious leader, as if uh, the planet crisis is just, we can solve it. You know, we'll come up with the data and we will solve it. So this is something uh, uh, we need to, wherever we are, whatever segment we're in, just become more aware of the spiritual uh, food that people are lacking. It, spiritual food encompasses compassion, love, freedom, stillness, calm, non-reactive, See the spiritual food? So look around. Look in the news. Look at, in that light of what people are lacking. It is not more stuff and more uh, ideas. They're lacking the ability to stop and be nourished by the spiritual food. Togetherness and meditation. Togetherness, feeling the interbeing, the connection. And this is not something you uh, get and you're done. It's like eating. You have to eat every day. See, it's not something I like, oh, I got it. Okay, never mind, no more. Every day we have to nourish our ability to feel connected to value togetherness, to see it as a food. Gathering, already you feel. So this is a kind of a training. I share like the plant we bring home. You have to take care of the plant. It's not like you bring it home, you leave it there. They give you a few flowers. And you just leave it there. You, you know, you need to interact. The same thing with uh, uh, meditation, food, and togetherness, the collective awareness, being nourished by that. Because we, we're not uh, uh, aware of that as a source of food. So this is a, a very important uh, uh, element as we Mm. embark on our journey to uh, help mm, our planet, help our uh, the symptoms. So do not do it as a human being. 
do it as a non-human being, like Mother Earth. It's only natural, you know? The cells, they know what to do. So we are the cells of Mother Earth, right? And we need to feed Mother Earth in ourselves through our legs onto the ground. And you sit is not to like do psychological analysis, kind of figure it out. Sit because you are eating for Mother Earth. Like, Mom, I stop for all of us. Ah, enjoy, Mom. You see your cells starts to happen. So don't just meditate, uh, you know, with your head. Huh? You meditate with every millions of cells, all the way to your nail and your toes. Togetherness. Remember, everything you touch can be spiritual food. When this starts to think too much or get too emotional, imbalance, bring down that energy. So summertime is coming. In a week, there are many uh, retreat is coming. And some of you are leaving this week, but uh, in a week we will have uh, a wave of uh, families, children, and it's a joy. And uh, whatever we're doing, responsible, there's many uh, staff coming as well. Just keep this awareness that uh, people are lacking spiritual food. That's why they come to Plum Village. And what we offer, how we offer it, the quality of the food we bring is not just the edible food, how we walk, how we sit, how we smile, how we take care of ourselves. This is what people feel when they come. I was in a happiness meeting this week with uh, lay friends, and yeah, it's just people are eating that. That's what they share. When they share their happiness, it is their reflection of what they ate. You see? Oh, today I walked in the forest and I saw flowers for the first time. They're sharing you what they they digested. You see? This is why. This is what people are missing. This is... uh, what we can nourish ourselves with, and this is what we can offer. No running. We can offer no running. Make that your offering. Not just, you know, in the Dhamma discussion circle or the kitchen or the meditation hall. How you work, how you enjoy. Remember, you can offer no running. You can offer no humans here. They're only Mother Earth. You know, you look around like that. So this is, uh, so talk to your ancestor. What, what rings to you? So this is something I'm um, I share, uh, my, actually my rock friend shared with you. I didn't know uh, how to prepare for this, so, but he sits in the room next to me, and I tell my roommate, I'm going to resist preparing for the Dhamma talk. And this morning I walk in to sit on the chair, and the rock was there. And so there's an offering from my, mm, our friend, Rock. And I'll end here with a quote from uh, one of my favorite poets, uh, Mary Oliver. (coughs) 
It's called the sun. Have you ever seen anything in your life more wonderful than the way the sun every evening, relaxed and easy, floats towards the horizon and into the clouds or the hills or the, or the rumpled sea and is gone and how it slides again out of the blackness every morning on the other side of the world like a red flower streaming upward on its heavenly oils. Say, on a morning in early summer, at its perfect imperial distance, and have you ever felt for anything such wild love? Do you think there is anywhere in any language a word billowing enough for the pleasure that fills you as the sun reaches out, as it warms you? as you stand there empty-handed? Or have you, too, turned from this world? Or have you, too, gone crazy for power, for things? Thank you, dear friends. <laughs>